On February 9, 1964, most Americans were glued to their televisions, witnessing something they had never seen before. As the Beatles took Ed Sullivan's stage, fans were screaming, shrieking and crying so loudly that one could hardly hear the music. This utter pandemonium became known as Beatlemania. Almost instantly, most of the people in the world came to know the name John Lennon. He became arguably the most famous person in the world. Later, baby boomers became vaguely aware that pastors were decrying the Beatles after Lennon proclaimed that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. But fans gave him a pass. After all, wasn't he the proponent of peace and love? Maybe they should have listened to the critics. John Lennon wasn't the gentle, kind hearted person that his image suggests. Because of his mother's promiscuity, including becoming pregnant while his father was at sea, his parents divorced. Lennon bounced from his mother's home to reside with an aunt and uncle. Perhaps because of his chaotic childhood, Lennon engaged in antisocial behavior from an early age. He became rebellious, resentful of authority and acted out in school, receiving up to three detentions in one day. For things like sabotage and fighting in class, he became particularly cruel to women. In the BBC item, How Lennon Was Made Into a Myth, Lennon's housekeeper painted him as a serial philanderer who was aggressive and violent. In an interview with Playboy, published just two days before he died, Lennon admitted, I used to be cruel to my woman, and physically. Any woman. I was a hitter. I couldn't express myself, and I hit. Lennon's antisocial tendencies particularly focused on religion. According to biographer Philip Norman, while in Hamburg, John would stand on the balcony each Sunday, taunting churchgoers. He attached a water-filled condom to an effigy of Jesus and hung it out for the churchgoers to see. Once he urinated on the heads of three nuns as they headed to services. Such conduct prompted little Richard, who was performing with the Beatles in Hamburg, to label Lennon the devil's own child. Lennon and the Beatles didn't generate hysteria in those early days. Author, Joseph Niesgoda, reports that those Hamburg gigs involved flop house hotels, bad food, and club owners who often failed to pay even the meager compensation agreed upon. Then things changed overnight. As if someone had thrown a switch. Niesgoda identifies the precise date, as December 27, 1960, when the Beatles played a welcome home gig, at Liverpool's Litherland Town Hall. Pete Best, then the Beatles' drummer, said, Litherland was an explosion in the fortunes of the Beatles. We were playing for dancing in a hall that could accommodate some 1500 on the dance floor at one time, but they stopped dancing when we played, and surged forward to be nearer to us, and to above all, scream. People didn't go to a dance to scream. This was news. Why the change? Nies Goda cites Lennon's mid-1960s statement to his friend, Tony Sheridan, who had once hired the Beatles as a backup band, and who had recorded with them. Lennon told Sheridan, I've sold my soul to the devil. That remark is also reported in Lennon, the definitive biography, by the British music journalist, and longtime Lennon friend, Ray Coleman. Given the relationships between Lennon, Sheridan, and Coleman, the I've sold my soul to the devil remark, would seem to be accurate. Skeptics might note, that the comment is a metaphor any musician might say, after being forced to compromise artistic visions for the commercial demands of record producers. Perhaps. But it is worth noting that Lennon again referenced selling his soul to the devil, in his final interview, conducted just hours before his assassination. In fact, he made two diabolical references during that interview. He first explained, how he came to write so many new songs after a five-year hiatus, by saying, I was possessed by the rock and roll devil. Later, Lennon said, I don't want to have to sell my soul, again, as it were, to have a hit record. Knees go to reviews legends and history, regarding people suspected of selling their soul to the devil, including certain popes and Johann Faust, upon whom the Faust Mephistopheles legend was based. He concludes that any pact with the devil is for twenty years of fame and fortune. So, let's keep the December 27, 1960 date of the first Beatle hysteria in mind.
Lenin's ongoing fascination with the occult is well documented, and was nourished in 1966 by the Indica Bookshop and Gallery in London. The Indica was ground zero for the emerging counterculture, in 1966. The Indica Bookshop was co-owned by Barry Miles, who later became Paul McCartney's biographer. The other co-owner was John Dunbar, who married Marianne Faithful who later had a four-year relationship with Mick Jagger, who purchased occultist books from Indica. John Lennon met Yoko Ono there, during her art show, in the Lower Level Art Gallery. Her show had been arranged by Paul McCartney. Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate often visited Yoko's show, while Tate was filming the movie, Eye of the Devil. Not coincidentally, Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Marianne Faithful, Roman Polanski, and Sharon Tate, all figure in later chapters to be released in this video series. Perhaps now is a good time to like this video, subscribe, and hit the notification button, so you are alerted when those later chapters are released. John Lennon became acquainted with the greatest Satanist of his time, Alistair Crowley, while a patron of the Indica. Indica's co owner, Miles, also published a counterculture newspaper, The International Times, that did a feature on Crowley in 1966. Crowley, who died of a heroin overdose in 1947, called himself the Great Beast 666 while alive, invoking the sign of the Antichrist from the Book of Revelation. The media of the day labeled him, the wickedest man in the world. He advocated sex magic, orgies of sex and drugs and established covens in Hollywood, and around the world. Most importantly, he advocated a philosophy or religion, which taught that, do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. In other words, people should engage in debauchery, unconstrained by criminal statutes, religion, or social conventions. Some people argue that Crowley was just a free spirit, and not an actual Satanist. They should obtain his writings, where he states that he went over to Satan's side, and that he was not content to just serve the devil, but intended on becoming his chief of staff. He chanted O oh my father, O oh Satan. He refers to, Thou devil our lord, O oh my father the devil. One book is entitled Satanic Verses, while another features the name Baphomet, an occultist deity, on the cover. Whenever one minimalizes the role of Lucifer, it's best to remember the words of Kaiser Soze at the close of the movie Usual Suspects. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Lennon became so enamored with Crowley, that Crowley was included among Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. The members of the band, represent the heroes of the Fab Four. Those who study the Beatles, conclude that John had nominated Crowley. Crowley wasn't the only vile hero Lennon nominated to Sgt. Pepper's band. According to the set designer, Sir Peter Blake, Hitler was supposed to be among the group, but his cardboard cutout was set aside, at the last minute. Copyrighted photos of the cover shoot, showing Hitler's image, removed from the band, exist. Sorry. We were not able to secure rights to those pictures for this video, but we will include links to them, in the description below. Lennon used to equate the Beatlemania reactions, of stadium-sized crowds. To the fanaticism of those hearing Hitler's speeches at Nuremberg's Zeppelinfeld Arena. When thousands of fans gathered below their balcony, Lennon gave the Nazi salute, and according to author Keith Badman, shouted Sieg Heil. Again, better, but copyrighted, photos are available online, with links in the description. Apparently, this wasn't a spur-of-the-moment analogy, but a long-standing goal of Lennon. During his brief stint at the Liverpool College of Art, just a few years before gaining fame, Lennon drew pictures of himself, at a podium, giving the same Nazi salute, with the crowd chanting Heil John. Notably, for the analysis in this video, many suspect Hitler of being one of Satan's three antichrists mentioned in the Book of Revelation. So, of Lennon's heroes nominated to Sgt. Pepper's band, Crowley adopted the symbol of the Antichrist, 
while Hitler is suspected of being one. Derek Taylor, the Beatles press officer, said in a 1964 statement to the Saturday Evening Post, that the Beatles were completely anti-Christ. He went on to say, I am as well, but they're so anti-Christ they shock me, which isn't an easy thing. Lennon made Crowley's Do What Thou Wilt philosophy his life message. He preached it in the song, Imagine, which urges the world to imagine there is no heaven, no hell, and no religion. He urges all to imagine living for only today, disregarding any possibility that they may be called to account for their acts by a higher power. Imagine is do what thou wilt put to verse. Just three months before his assassination, Lennon told Playboy magazine, the whole Beatle idea was to do what you want, right? Lennon embraced Crowley's do what thou wilt philosophy to the very end. Most people alive in March, 1966, remember the uproar that arose about Lennon's statement, reported in a fan magazine, that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. However, his full quote is a more pointed attack on Christianity. His entire statement was, Christianity will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right and will be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. Matthew, chapter 4, gives an example of how Satan offers fame and fortune. If Lucifer had made a bargain with Lenin, wouldn't Lenin's public denigration of Christ's status, be the kind of thing Lucifer would ask in return? In the Lenin prophecy, Nisgoda concludes that blasphemy is required in any pact with the devil. Trivializing Jesus as less important than rock stars, would almost certainly qualify in that regard. Just a few months later, the Beatles released the album, Yesterday and Today, originally featuring the Beatles in butcher coats with slabs of raw meat and decapitated baby dolls. Lennon is on record as being the primary advocate of that cover, despite opposition. In a 1974 interview, Lennon stated that the imagery was intended to show the world that we're no angels. To do so, he invoked images of infanticide, the highest ritual of Satanism. And as if to underscore the diabolical connection, in the photo, Lennon conspicuously points to the netherworld. Other Beatles imagery continued to pay homage to Satan's minion, Crowley. Crowley had produced a painting of Red Wizards, that was later used on a 1958 book about Crowley, by John Simmons. Frederick Seaman, Lennon's assistant, reports that whenever they visited a city, Lennon had him scour bookstores, and purchase entire shelves of occultist books for him. Can there be much doubt that Lennon was aware of Simmons' book and Crowley's painting? As such, when the Beatles filmed the Magical Mystery Tour, they included Red Wizards. A coincidence? Or yet another homage to Crowley? The satanic symbology continued when Lennon and the Beatles named their recording company, Apple Records. That happens to be the fruit which the serpent gave to Eve in the Garden of Eden. The serpent separated Adam and Eve from God through the bite of an apple. The Apple logo was used until 2009, long after music streaming became popular. Accordingly, music fans eventually began consuming Apple Record products, in digital bites. Perhaps the greatest mystery about John Lennon to his fans is, why Yogo? When he divorced his wife Cynthia, Lennon was one of the wealthiest and most celebrated men on the planet. According to biographers, women were readily sexually available to him. And he chose Yoko? It was not likely her acting ability, demonstrated by her role in the sexploitation film, Satan's Bed, which featured gratuitous, gang rape scenes. Nor could it be because of her musical talent. So, why Yoko? Could it be because she is, or at least fancies herself, a witch? This is not a mere claim made in a video. It is a bold proclamation by Yoko Ono herself. Her 2007 record album is entitled, Yes, I'm, a Witch. In case you didn't get the message, she released another album entitled, Yes, I'm, a Witch, too. Continuing with a demonic theme, she later released an album, Take Me to the Land of Hell. Lennon's assistant, Frederick Seaman, wrote that Yoko seemed to have John hypnotized, as he wouldn't make even the simplest decisions, without deferring to her, whom he called, mother. Hypnotized? 
Or, given her witch status, did she have him under a spell? Might that be the answer to why Yogo? Another reason might be their shared interest in occult practices. They had a personal psychic and tarot card reader, John Green, who wrote a book after Lennon's murder, entitled Dakota Days. They were considerable fans of numerology, consulting the occultist book, Shero's Book of Numbers, before performing simple tasks, such as dialing a telephone number. John's number was nine, which was often worked into his music, with songs like Number Nine Dream Song, and Revolution Nine. Different sources suggest that the couple decided to reside at, the Dakota apartment building, because the address was a favorable number. Others claim the choice was made because of the Dakota's long history of, hauntings and occultism, which also prompted Roman Polanski to set the devilish film Rosemary's Baby, there. John Green's, Dakota Days, and Robert Rosen's book, Nowhere Man, both describe a trip Green and Yoko made to Columbia to meet a certified witch. Yoko, reportedly paid $60,000 in order to gain the ability to cast spells. Frederick Seaman reports that Paul McCartney once told Lennon that he would be staying in John and Yoko's favorite Tokyo hotel. Seaman reports that the couple disliked Paul so intensely, that they resented him staying in their hotel. As such, Yoko reportedly connived with other occultists, to cast a spell on Paul. When McCartney was arrested with nearly half a pound of marijuana in his luggage, upon arrival in Japan, he was deported and thus never stayed in the hotel. Yoko claimed her spell had worked. Lennon had lifelong fears and premonitions about an early death. Newsweek mentions a 1965 interview where Lennon predicted that he would be popped off by some loony. He often said he wouldn't make it to 40, although he was actually murdered less than two months after his 40th birthday. Was that because he made a 20-year pact with the devil when he was 20? Both Seaman and Knees go to detail John Lennon's oft-stated concerns about an early, possibly impending death, in the last 18 months of his life. The book, Let Me Take You Down. Inside the Mind of Mark David Chapman, quotes Seaman. He had a mystical compulsion with mystical ideas of death and rebirth. He would go on and on about all this mystical stuff. Seaman further reported, that Lennon talked as if he had a rendezvous with death. He had nightmares of violent death, weird, recurrent dreams, about dying, about getting shot. However, the most direct description of Lennon's fears of death at the hand of the devil, is found in his 1980 song, Help Me to Help Myself, which was included in the re-release of the Double Fantasy album. Consider the lyrics from the standpoint of Lennon's lifelong antipathy toward religion in general, and Christianity in particular. He says, Well, I tried so hard to stay alive. But the angel of destruction keeps on hounding me all around. Oh no, help me Lord. Lennon is trying hard to stay alive, but Satan is hounding him? For what? His soul? After a lifetime of vilifying Christianity, Lennon now appeals to the Lord for assistance. Lennon's murderer, himself, bolsters the suspicion that Lucifer harvested Lennon's soul. John David Chapman, had been a born-again Christian and John Lennon fan, but has consistently said that satanic influences underlie the assassination. He told Barbara Walters in a televised interview, I remember turning to Satan for the strength to kill Lennon. The book, Let Me Take You Down, details five years of face-to-face -face dialogue between the author and Chapman. Chapman would sit naked before his stereo and pray. Hear me Satan. Accept these pearls of evil and rage. I ask only, that you give me the power to kill John Lennon. Give me the life of John Lennon. Chapman details that his mind had split into two, with the larger adult part of himself being good but a small part of himself was an evil child. He said, there is a very small part of me that is very powerful and very evil. In a written statement made to police, several hours after the murder, he said, the small part of me must be the devil. Chapman said that just before the murder, the child was praying to the devil, and the adult was praying to the Lord. Then, as the limousine pulled to the curb, 
The child turned to Satan for the power to pull the trigger. The adult tried to get away, but the evil child in Chapman said, No. I want to kill him. Devil help me, devil. Give me the power to do this. According to the Washington Post, the psychiatrist who examined Chapman, in anticipation of an insanity defense, said Chapman didn't just believe in Satan. He knew Satan. Amazingly, Chapman reports that as he stood outside the Dakota, Mia Farrow walked by, leading her flock of kids to Central Park. Farrow had starred in Rosemary's Baby, a movie in which her husband makes a deal, allowing Lucifer to rape and impregnate his wife, in exchange for fame and fortune. Chapman took this Farrow sighting as a sign, so that the evil child prevailed, and he emptied his revolver into Lennon. If one accepts Nies Goda's premise that pacts with the devil entail twenty-year terms, and his suggestion that such a pact must have been made before the December 27, 1960 Liverpool concert. Then it is worth noting, that Lennon was assassinated by a demonically driven murderer, on December 8, 1980, which may well have been the twenty-year anniversary of any such pact with the devil. And that date is likely just weeks after Lennon wrote, Help me to help myself, asking the Lord's help, as the devil hounded him. Lennon famously asked, You say you want a revolution? And then proclaimed, You know we all want to change the world. Lennon did lead a revolution. The sexual revolution. And he did change the world. The 1950s and 60s had been a time of relative innocence, where Teen Angel and Johnny Angel were hit records where most girls saved intercourse until marriage, and where Playboy magazine only showed the female bosom to sell magazines, society tipped precisely in 1967, when the Sgt. Pepper album was released. The 1967 Summer of Love, was actually the time when sex in the complete absence of true love, started becoming commonplace. Lennon invited the world to imagine there was no heaven, no hell, and no religion. So, society began moving to where we are now. A hookup culture, where one can arrange meaningless sex, and adulterous marital affairs online. Where the hardest core pornography, is immediately available to anyone, including children, via cell phone. Where nearly two-thirds of births, are out of wedlock, in some communities, and where groups organize and advocate, for practices that had been illegal, and considered sinful, for thousands of years. In the span of a few years from the release of Sgt. Pepper, the once forbidden fruit, had become the mainstay diet of much of society. The research underlying the video you just watched, was gathered for the Amazon legal thriller novel, So Help Me God. If you are interested in how the information you just learned, fits into that novel, you will find a link to the book on Amazon.com, in the description below. Fiction writers love conspiracy theories. Because they either comprise fiction fashioned from true facts, or they are amazing truth once thought to be fiction. I leave to you, whether there have been demonic influences on our culture. As you decide, remember Kaiser Sozi's warning. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled, is making the world believe he doesn't exist. As for me, I'll be saying a prayer to Saint Michael the Archangel, who is charged with protecting us from evil spirits, who wander the world seeking the ruin of souls.